things going? In all things, give thanks to the Lord, amen, for he is good to his people. Uh, I want to say, uh, appreciate everybody. Um, I didn't mention this this morning, forgot all about it. Uh, I guess I was trying to think about, you know, the sermon and streaming live with nobody sitting here and so on. But I appreciate everybody um, supporting their church last Sunday. Appreciate John uh, for helping out in the service, even though he tore the microphone up. That's, that's an easy fix, no big deal. Uh, <laughs> hi, John. Uh, Michael for helping with the streaming and um, for Pastor Jason Cooley, uh, Jason Cooley, Jason Hutzel uh, for being in my place. I hope you enjoyed him. I love Jason. I love his spirit. Uh, he's a good man of God. I appreciate him. And um, so anyway, hopefully, uh, if everything is still on, I will be going to uh, Pastor Reg Kelly's church, Liberty Faith Bible Church in Norwood, Missouri, uh, in May, I think, the, maybe the first Sunday in May, I'll have to look at my calendar to see, but um, <clears throat> Pastor Reg wants me to come and just kind of beef up the, the Word of God issue, the Bible issue, King James issue, talk about numbers, King James Code, things like that. And uh, some of the things I've learned and gleaned from the Word of God, about the Word of God, and uh, just kind of as a help to His people. And then don't forget our Bible conference, what I'm calling the Sword and Shield Conference. Uh, the, uh, in May, I don't have the dates in front of me either, but um, we'll be announcing it as long as this virus thing settles down. In fact, I would really like, um, I'm not making an absolute statement yet, but after having one Sunday of nobody here, I'm, I want to be done with it. So we'll see how it goes as far as this week is concerned, whether we're going to have let maybe just a limited group of people come uh, into the building. We just We have to protect uh, the, the young children. We have to protect, uh, we still have an expectant mother in our church, and we have to protect our elderly, our elders. And um, they were home watching this morning. I was thankful for that. I got a call from somebody, right, I mean, right after the service. One of, our, one of our local Bethel people called me and said, Pastor, that was exactly what I needed. That made my day. It really did. Uh, because I understand the fear. That, you know, when you're sitting at home, you're worried about what everything's going on. You're watching news all day long. Kind of like on 9-11, if you, some of you remember that. But watching the news and then looking at social media, which can be a negative distraction in times like this. Because of the disinformation out there. I'm going to say, in some cases, miss it misinformation and here's the difference <clears throat> disinformation is deliberate somebody is spreading lies about an issue about a person um, and they're doing it deliberately because they have an agenda misinformation is someone saying something and I'm going to use the word ignorantly where they misunderstood a fact or they misunderstood a situation or, or it was an accidental misrepresentation. It was a view given by somebody that they didn't really, they didn't look into it too well. It was an, sort of an accident. So I can understand that. I've made several of my own, okay? So I'm not pointing fingers. So you have, to, you have to be careful of the disinformation and the misinformation. And again, trust God's word. And there's, there's something right now that I'm looking at that's going on in this world that I have been calling to God 
several times, God, show me if this is true or not. Show me if it's true. If it's true, I'll sound the alarm. If it's not, I will sound an alarm and let people know that it's not true. So, and I won't say what it is yet, but just help me pray because like I said this morning, when the watchman, if a watchman, if a guy's on a tower and he blows a trumpet every time he sees a leaf move and everybody comes out ready to go to war, after a while, that guy blowing the trumpet, everybody's going to say, at just him, he, just, he does that, we just don't listen to it anymore. One of these days, he's going to be right and nobody's going to be prepared. So, you know, we just pray that we follow the Lord in everything, all right? Uh, let's take our Bibles, go to Genesis 6, but I appreciate everybody helping out last week and everybody supporting your church, supporting our ministries, and we certainly appreciate the, the blessings that many of you have sent our way. Uh, just the appreciation notes uh, that you've sent to me and members of my family and people in our church, uh, I want to say thank you for that and um, just for the blessings that God's people have been all around the world uh, to our little church here at Bethel and what it is we're trying to do. We're still planning on feeding people in Kenya. And um, I was talking with Michael last night about, you know, what if we had to feed people here? I, I think people have hoarded enough food for this thing, crisis, whatever. Uh, if they've eaten it already, let them live on their fat for a while, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. But I think there's a greater need in a place where they don't have a Walmart or a Costco. And that is Turkana, Kenya. So help us pray about that, and um, we'll see what God does. All right. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 6, we're there. Um, and I started this a week, two weeks ago tonight. And actually dealing with the issue of Christian preparation. God's people being prepared for what is coming. There are those who look for a great catastrophe to happen. There are companies that make bomb shelters and bunkers. Uh, there's a guy I follow on YouTube and um, he makes underground bunkers that, are, that can be stocked, fully stocked, with a generator, with, uh, with an air system that vents out anything that's not supposed to be in the air and all kinds of dehydrated food and you can practically live in these things for a couple of years if you could stand being cooped up like that which probably most people can't, but uh, anyway, there's that. Then there is what people have done with this COVID virus. They've kind of overstocked on things, um, and it's not like this is the zombie apocalypse, even though it's a pretty serious illness. And so the question is, should God's people be prepared for what's coming? And we'll try to answer that in the scripture. Let's read Genesis chapter 6 and let's read the cause. Um, Michael, this is slide number 8 that I'm starting on uh, upstairs. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. Uh, here's, here's why God was going to do what he did. And remember the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. There's wisdom to be gained from this. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That means man was reprobate. No chance of bringing him back whatsoever. The Bible talks about this coming a day when their conscience is going to be seared with a hot iron. That's going to happen. I believe that's related to the iron kingdom. That's coming in Daniel chapter 2, the fourth kingdom. In verse 6, it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. We touched on that and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah 
found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So I'm, we're looking at a situation right now in time that man's imagination is pretty wicked. It's very, very evil. There are, I believe, still people to be saved. We're still going to preach the gospel. We're still going to reach out with a loving hand and a loving heart and have compassion on people who have fallen into all the evils that this world brings and ask them, do you want to know Jesus? Would you like to be made free from the bondage that you're in? There's still people out there, I believe, that can be brought in. But God had gotten to a, pl and God had gotten to a place here in Genesis where they were reprobate and I believe also there's coming a time when man himself, all the Gentiles that's going to be saved, the last one's going to be saved. And God knows who it is already. Wouldn't you like to know? But God already knows who it is. And he's got a time set and he knows when man's going to become reprobate and God's going to say once again that he's done. Now, he promised that he would not flood the earth with water. We'll get to that later on. And he's not. He's going to flood it with something different. Something far worse than water. So keep that in mind. The thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. And so now we see the cause of what's happening. And I think we're living in a time right now where we, we can see that we're close to that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask your blessings on this afternoon. Thank you, Lord, for a beautiful day. That wind feels great. The sun feels good on our faces. And Father, we thank you, God, for blessing us the way you have. Thank you, God, for allowing us the benefit and the blessing that even though we cannot come physically to be in your house, today we can still gather with the saints the way you called for us to do where you told us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And Father, we see that day coming. So Father, help us, God, to be about your business in comforting one another, in being a blessing to one another, reaching out to one another. Father, there's ways to communicate that don't require us being in the same room together. So, Father, help us, dear God, to make use of the things that we have to reach out to people and to be a blessing to them in a time when people have a lot of questions. And, Father, we know, God, that people are looking for answers. And I pray, dear God, that some would find answers, Father, through this network of people that we call Bethel. And God, that you would use us wherever we're scattered, However, Lord, you have us separated out. This is the way you did it in the book of Acts. You separated everybody out and they went from where they were to preach the gospel. I pray, dear God, that you would do the same thing. Help us to reach out to people and love them, be kind to them and care for them and uh, use us for your kingdom and your glory. Father, there's a woman that I filled her gas tank up the other day. And I pray, dear God, that she would watch the DVD that I gave her and that she would come to know you as her Savior. Father, I'm not looking for credit. I'm just asking you, God, to save that woman. She just seemed like she needed salvation. I pray, dear God, that you would help her. Bless her in Jesus' name. Bless your word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So now let's continue uh, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. <clears throat> Here's God telling Noah what to do. God, God is leading now Noah in preparing for what's coming. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, thou shalt and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. This is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, the height of it 30 cubits. And a window shalt thou make to the ark and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. At, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life. When God says, I, even I, he's wanting, he's wanting Noah to know 
that God and God alone is doing this. This is not the product of some natural event. This is not uh, the government causing it to rain, cause it, fracturing the earth, causing water to come forth. This is not anything that man is doing. God is doing this. I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. And I say that because, again, a lot of people on the internet, when a hurricane happens, a bad hurricane happens, people start saying, ah, NASA did this. This is weather control. Man, this is harp. Man did this. God's in control. God is always in control of the weather. You don't believe that? Ask the disciples who were on the ship with Jesus when he was taking a nap and a storm came up. Does he not command even the wind and the waves to be still? He sure does. If he can command them to be still, he can command them to rise up. And that is exactly what he did here. So in verse 18, he says, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark. This goes back to the previous passage that we read where it says, No found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So it's a covenant of grace. Some people, and they believe the King James, they say that Noah was saved by his works. Noah was saved by the work of building the ark. Not at all. Noah was saved by grace through faith. It was, it was Hebrews 11 tells us that it was by faith Noah built the ark and prepared the things for his, him and his family. It was by grace through faith and nothing else. Amen. So he said, I will establish my covenant. So this is the promise to us. Even though we are saved and God has a covenant with us and God has grace on us, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't think about the possibilities of what could happen. But it's clear to me in this passage that God is leading in everything that he wants Noah to do. He's not leaving anything out here. And I, I believe that God tamed the animals that he brought to Noah. That they, when he went out and got two tigers, he wasn't worried that he was going to be eaten alive by the tigers. So I believe that God brought these animals to Noah, that God tamed them for him, that he kind of suppressed their wild nature so that they got on the ark. And Noah didn't have too hard of a problem. Um, but anyway, with verse 18, but with thee will I establish my covenant. Thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. Shall come unto thee is where I'm getting that from. And thou and take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. So here's what I believe. The, the gist of it is, I believe that, I mean, people ask me, should we get guns? Should we get bullets? Should we, you know, stock up on ammunition because the war is going to break out and we're going to fight for our country? Should we get, I don't have the answers to all this. I don't. It doesn't hurt to do any of those things. It doesn't hurt. I like something that I heard from our president. I heard it yesterday. I watched a video today and I reheard it again. He is enacting a wartime defense act to force, I forgot what car company it was, GM, into making these ventilators. I mean, he told them to do it. They've been dragging their feet. So he basically put a law in place that's already been passed and said, you're doing it starting today. Quit dragging your feet. And he said, I want us to make so many ventilators that we have extras that we can give to other countries who don't have them. 
because so if you if you go out and buy way more toilet paper than you're going to need or way more spam than you're going to need or way more food or bread or whatever that you're going to then give that to somebody who doesn't have that much that's the right thing to do that's the christian thing to do noah wasn't stingy with the food that he gathered he gathered for him and his family and for every kind of animal that was on that ark that needed to be fed Noah and his family did that. So, let's go to um, let's go to Psalm 144. Psalm 144. This is God now giving us wisdom about preparation, preparing for times that are coming. Psalm 144, verse 11. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouths speak of vanity and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. That our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. That our garners may be full, affording all manner of store. There's the word that we're looking at. Store. That our garners may be full. I, driving up, to Minnesota and back, I drove through some of the best farming land in the world. Iowa, Minnesota, I've been out, we usually hold a conference in Indiana, I love going out there because it's farm country. Soybeans and corn. Everywhere, soybeans and corn. And when those crops come in, what do they do? They harvest them and they store that up, saving it for a time when they will need it. I mean, think, think of how God designed most crops like beans and corn and wheat. He designed it so that when it dries, it stabilizes and it stays that way for a long, 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 long time. Things like potatoes and onions starches with sugar onions for flavoring that will last a long 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 time without refrigerating that won't spoil easily things like that god designed that for us to store up so and i want you to think then of the spiritual aspect of that because that's eventually where we're going with this does it benefit us in the physical realm to store up what we've harvested what we've worked for absolutely and I'll say this also for people who are financially challenged. And by that, I mean they don't save money. At some point, couples or even individuals have to take responsibility for their own financial whatever whatever status they're in maybe they don't have the best job in the world what that means is then you can't afford the stuff that's at the mall you have to get it from walmart or dollar general or wherever you can get it live within your means and then you'll be able to save so that you will have in the future. I don't manage the finances in my family. Never have. That's been my wife. And she's the reason why all our bills get paid. Because I would do a lousy job of it. She's done an outstanding job of it. And I'm telling you, this applies also to finances money save your money save it don't blow it don't spend it don't buy things that you don't need and don't justify what you bought as if you really needed it if you stop and think about it food raiment lodging and health care there are the four primary needs of any person or family 
Anything else is extra. You need food, you need clothes, you need a place to live, and you need a certain amount of an ability to buy medicines and go to a doctor, however you want to do that. Everybody needs that. And if you blow all your money and you don't save up and you don't store up, you won't have. So what happens, and I'm, being, I'm trying to be nice about this, but what happens is people will blow money buy things that don't qualify under the four essentials that I just listed. Then when their utility bills or their house bill or their rent or whatever can't get paid, they encumber that burden on somebody else to pay it for them. See what I'm saying? So not only is it not, not only is it okay to store, it's the right thing to do to store so that somebody else isn't encumbered with your mismanagement. Does that make sense? Okay? Well, I'm glad there's nobody here. Whew. So, but verse 13, that our garners may be full, affording all manner of, all manner of store. You've got grain, you've got plenty of cattle, plenty of hogs in the pen, plenty of chickens in the coop, plenty of eggs in the basket, plenty of money in the bank. That our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets. So God is not against sensible and righteous gain. God is not against that. It's a blessing from God to have gain. When you get a raise at work, that's gain. You probably earned it, but you thank God for that. Thank God I got a raise. It came at just the right time. I got bills to pay. Okay, but go back to verse 11 of that passage. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children whose mouth speak of vanity and their right hand is the right hand of falsehood. In other words, stay away from the wrong side of the tracks and stay away from certain kinds of people that's going to lead you into wickedness because isn't it interesting that sin is easy to get to as long as you're willing to pay for it. Sin always costs money. There are no clinics giving out free bottles of Jack Daniels, in other words. They're in, in states where medical marijuana is legal. There are no companies giving it away. Grr, don't get me started. So stay away from unrighteous people and God will bless your ability to store. Malachi chapter 3. Listen to this. Now, I always have to say this because preachers of this generation get accused of nailing everybody every sermon about tithing and giving. I don't. You will be hard pressed to find a sermon where I said, you better give, you better tithe, you better do this, I, we need more money. You won't find it. But this is part of it and I'm going to preach it. Malachi 3 verse 8. Will man rob God? I have to tell this story. Pastor John Uter, very good friend of mine. I had been to his church several times. He had a man in his church that John preached Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 11 about robbing God. How do you rob God? In tithes and offerings. You don't give. You don't tithe. So he preached that. And John read in the book of Revelation where thieves and robbers don't go into heaven. So this man jumped him after the service. And he said, that's in the Old Testament. That's on page, that, that, that's, on, that's on page, uh, what page is that in my Bible? That's on page uh, 1180. That's not the New Testament, so it doesn't apply to us. And yet you said that I'm robbing God because I don't tithe. 
And him and Pastor Uter got kind of got into it. John was giving him scripture. This man was raising up all kinds of arguments. And the man said to Pastor John, I know somebody who can settle this. John said, who? He said, well, he said Mike Hogger. John said, I got his number right here. The man called me. I didn't know this had happened. The man called me and asked me the, the question, you know, pastor said I'm a robber and a thief because I don't, I don't always tithe. I, I, I give to, I do, do, do good things for my family and I, I do this and I do that. And I asked him the question. I said, do you tithe regularly? And he said, well, no. I said, then you are a thief. He didn't like that. John knew what I would say. Okay? And this man, I don't know what he was thinking of me. But I believe the Bible. Will a man rob God? Yet had, ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. God said that. I didn't say it. It's not my words. That is God that said that. Ye are cursed. You listen to your Bible now. You read it. You are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes. And the tithe, God made it so simple. You just move the decimal over one place. Is that right? No, two places. If it's $100... You tithe 10, so you move it one place. Move the decimal one place, all you got to do. If you made $100, you tithe $10. If you made $1,000, you tithe $100. If you made $1,829.32, then you tithe, what did I say, $1,829, so you tithe hundred and eighty two dollars and ninety some odd cents it's that simple God made it easy and I want you to get this who gave you the job who gave you the money who gave you the increase God did it is a gift that you don't deserve and yet God who is greater than all of us did not ask for ninety percent and us keep 10%. There's some country, I think one, there's like one country in Europe, Sweden, up to 80% in taxes they take. They're a socialist country. And they take 80% of people's hard-earned money. Are you kidding me? I wouldn't live there for nothing. Okay? So God didn't ask for the most amount. He asked for the least. Give me the first 10%, you keep the other 90%. Well, what kind of deal is that? But that's the deal that God made with us. He made it with Israel. He makes it in the New Testament because it's for the provision of the men of God who labor in the Word of God and for the ministry of the church. So bring me all your tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. How would you like to have so much money that your bank said, you're going to have to find another bank because we don't have, our computers can't handle that. You know, I'm making an exaggeration, but that's what God said. And I will rebuke, listen to this, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. So my question is, how many of you have a devourer? It's just always, you just seem like you can't tithe because you never have any money. It's always just going out, going out, going out, going out. Let me tell you, there's a, actually a secret to this. It's not really a secret because it's in the Bible, it's very plainly. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. So again, I'm going to go back to my wife. 
we were young. She was having babies, wasn't able to work. I was laid off a lot, wintertime in construction. And God was teaching us, a young couple starting out, how to trust God with our money. And my wife came to me. It was a true story. I have enough money to pay the electric bill or the tithe. And she said, I don't know what to do. And I can remember that's probably really one of the first times that my wife and I ever really talked about tithing and giving to God as a couple. And I was young and things were very simple for me and I said, we tithe. We tithe. She said, okay. I could tell she was nervous. So we tithe. And God paid the electric bill. And I've seen it over and over. I, had, I could tell story after story after story. I'd rather stick with the scriptures. But you get what I'm saying. God will release a devourer on your stores because you're not putting God first. Now, it doesn't always have to be money-related. You're not putting God first in decisions you're making about life, about marriage, about jobs, about anything. God's second, third, fourth, fifth, I've been there before, I will be there again. So I'm, I'm preaching to me too. But when you put God first, he always rebukes the devourer. And then all of a sudden now you're able to pay bills that you weren't able to pay. And you don't know where the money came from. I mean, imagine when Michael went out to Kenya, when the day that we found the orphans, Michael, how many families did we feed that day? About 1,500? About 1,500 families. I have no idea where the food came from. Okay? But we didn't know how many was going to show up, so I'm positive we didn't know how much food to buy. But God prepared it so that we had all the food that we needed for those 1,500 families to feed them for a week. That's God. That's just the stuff that he does. If you don't believe me, then read the stories in the Bible about the cruise of oil that the man of God said to the widow and her son, go get, she had one cruise of oil, and he said, give it to the man of God first. She did that, and then he said, now go get everything in your house that can hold oil. Get it all. And once she gave to the man of God, she then took the cruise of oil and started pouring it in bowls, barrels, buckets, bottles. That all starts with B. Everything she could find until she ran out of stuff to pour that oil in. And there was enough oil for her and her son throughout that whole famine that was going on. God took care of them. That's a story out of the Bible that you can believe. This Bible is right. And if you're worried about where your food is going to come from in case of some national disaster, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God did not let any of the Israelites starve one day in the wilderness. Not one day. Except for the Sabbath when they didn't do what God said. Okay? But he said... Verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit from before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, I tell you what, turn to uh, Joel. Turn to Joel chapter 1. I'm going to go off my notes here because I just thought of a verse that backs that up. God said, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, God said that he was going to send a blight to the land, the likes had never been seen before. Joel chapter 1, verse 2. Hear ye this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, even in the days of your fathers? 
Tell ye your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. There's four generations here. And he said, that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Four. And he's talking about devourers coming in, because that's what they do. Whether the locusts or caterpillars or whatever they do, they eat. Canker means to eat, to eat away. So think of this virus out there. And God said, awake ye drunkards and weep, and how all ye drinkers of wine. And Pastor Cooley brought this up in Minnesota while I was up there. We were talking. He said, he goes to the store, people are stocking up on food, but then you got people who are stocking up on booze. They're afraid they're going to run out of booze. Liquor. Jack Daniels. Vodka. Oh, we can't run out of that. And God said, awake you drunkards and weep. And how you drinkers of wine? Because the new wine for it is cut off from your mouth. You want to drink that old, that old leavened wine and that strong drink? Fine. I want to cut off the new wine. That stuff that actually benefits you health-wise. God said, I'll cut off what's good for you and just let you be drunks. You ever notice somebody who's been on drugs for a long time? Are they overweight? Never. Because they get so deep into the drugs, they don't eat. This Bible is right. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians 16. This is what God said in His Word. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by Him in store as God hath prospered Him, that there be no gatherings when I come. First day of the week, Lay it up. In other words, Paul said, instead of when I come, us trying to take one great big gigantic offering all at once, why don't we do it on the installment plan? See, God, God takes care of us. God does not say to us, okay, at the end of the, last year you filled out your taxes and I'm showing here that you earned $45,000 last year. Well, come January 1st, I want you to tithe on $45,000. That's $4,500. I want $4,500 first Sunday of this next year, or I will not save you. God didn't say that. God said, give it as you increase. Give it a little bit at a time. Little is much when God is in it, right? So he, he says, you earn a paycheck every week? Bring it in every week. First day of the week, which is today, the first day of the week, bring it in. And let every one of you lay by him in store. So now I, I want to get to this before I, before I close it out today. Go back to Psalms 23. Here's, here's how God then aids our preparation. Okay? So, and, you, and you know Psalm 23, so you're probably running through it in your mind going, yeah, my cup, absolutely, my cup runneth over. Look at it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not, I, I used to, as a kid, I never understood that verse. Why don't I want him? If he's my shepherd, how come I don't want him? I didn't understand that verse. I get it now. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I have need of nothing. I mean, a shepherd, what does a shepherd do? Sit in the barn all day playing Nintendo? No. He's out with the sheep, leading them to the pastures so that they can feed. That's what the good shepherd does. The idle shepherd leaves the flock. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And I can tell you, horses and cows and sheep and goats, they all like the green grass before they like the brown, yellow grass. They do. 
He leadeth me beside the still waters. That's drinking water. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest, thou, thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But he promised here, God would aid us in that our cup would run over. And again, what then would you do if you found out your neighbor ran out of food or toilet paper? Would you not give of your overflow? It would be the right thing to do, would it not? Some of you might be saying, well, well, then I might run out. Has God ever let you run out? Would God, if you gave the last dime you had to somebody, would not God then bless you double? It's about trusting God. Uh, go to uh, Psalm 68. I turned right to it. Look at there. Psalm 68, verse 8. The earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Thou, God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. Thy congregation hath dwelt therein. Thou, O God, hast prepared of thy goodness for the poor. He sent plentiful rain so the crops had plenty of water so the grass that the cattle ate had plenty of water to grow so that it could grow so that the cattle would feed on it. That's what God does. Now think of that spiritually. The rain is His doctrine, His word that comes down gently to us. What about Bible reading, storing up the Word of God like fat? When we eat, our body takes it and converts it all, and what it doesn't need, it converts it to lipids and stores it. That's what this is, and this is hanging under my chin. So that when I go to sleep at night, my liver can still maintain my blood sugar level by pulling from the storage. My body lays in store and prepares for days. And they say that us Caucasians living in the Northern Hemisphere, we always put on weight around the fall and winter time. Why? Because our ancestors knew that they may not have enough food to last them throughout till the next year or whatever. And so they would have to have that in store. I don't know, but it sounds about right to me that God said he would send plentiful rain and he's prepared goodness for the poor. Because if people who have nothing, who are they going to turn to when they need something? Those who don't have it? Those who have it in plenty. Okay? Uh, let's do Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30, verse 24. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. What do ants do? You ever, you ever watch the ants at a picnic? Ants go, when one ant finds something 
nice and good and juicy and flavorful on, laying on the ground. They go back and tell all the other ants, and the ants go marching one by one, and they pull it out, and they take it down into the ant hill, down underground, and they store it because they need it later. They don't eat it right then away. They just, they store it. The ants are people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Now, careth God for conies and spiders and ants? No. He cares for us. He's going to help us store up for harder times. One more. Isaiah 21. Isaiah 21. Here we go. Verse 4. My heart panted. Fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Remember what it was that provoked Noah to build the ark and to store it up. It was fear. He knew what was coming. And he said, we got we to get this done or we're not going to make it. The night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Prepare the table. Watch in the watchtower. Eat, drink, arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, go set a watchman. And let him declare what he seeth. God said, set a watchman. Prepare a table. So it sounds like to me that God is in the prepper business. He is. Now, next Sunday night, we're going to take all this. We're going to be, I can tell you, we'll be in uh, 1 Corinthians 2. Okay? About spiritual preparation. How to prepare, the, you can prepare physically, which is okay. But how do we prepare spiritually? Maybe it's God preparing us for what's coming. Think about that, all right? I've enjoyed teaching this to you. I've enjoyed going through it. I love it. I need it. I need it. Father, we thank you for giving us the riches of your word. Your word is so alive and powerful and right. Father, I thank you for giving me a wife that had a godly mindset. Her heart was in the right place. And you've blessed me through her. And I thank you for. And Father, there are times, Lord, to save up. Because, Father, we find out that there are times when we need that which is saved. It's there for times like these when we need it the most. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would instill it in the hearts of your people. Train them and teach them. Help them, Father, Lord, to be good with their finances, to live within their means. There's no shame in that. The shame comes in having to beg because we were foolish with our money. So, Father, teach us how. Help us, dear God, to ask you to help us, to ask you for help, and to put you first in everything that we do, so that when lean times come, just like in the days of Joseph, we have plenty. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you would prepare your people for the days that are coming, because we don't know what's coming, but you do. And we are trusting, God, that you will lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thank you for being our God. Remind us who you are. We pray in Jesus' name.
Amen. God bless you. Thank you very much for joining with us this afternoon. We will see you Wednesday night, 7 p.m.